Well, I started sensing some things in my hotel room. God's dispatching more angels to this local church for the purpose of miracle power. Give Jesus a great big hand clap all over the sanctuary. Praise the Lord. Isn't it great to know you're dead center in the middle of God's will for your life right now? I want you to lift both hands before you're seated. Father, I thank you in advance for all of the wonderful things you'll do this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord another great hand clap. You can be seated. I thought I should uh, say this before I begin, which is, if you read in the life and ministry of Paul the Apostle, he said they were going to head to Asia, and then they saw a vision, he had a dream, and he knew in his spirit he shouldn't go to Asia, which shows you something about Paul's ministry, which is kind of how I run things too, which is he was just moving, moving and preaching, and uh, basically, it took a red flag for him not to go somewhere, not just wandering around in the woods waiting for a supernatural door to open up. But then sometimes, when you're preaching, there are opportunities that open up supernaturally. And I was in, I, uh, I can't remember when your pastor called our office, but that morning I was driving to work, it was in the springtime, and I thought to myself, what a great meeting December was, just out of the blue, down here in Hobbs. And I knew I was coming back in, in December. And I thought, well, that's the week before Christmas. The summer would probably give us more, more room to maneuver and uh, make for a better week. I wonder if he'd be open to that. And I, don't, I never call and, and do that kind of stuff. You know, it's like somebody invited you over to their house for dinner in July. And you say, would it be okay if I came tonight instead? <laughs> so I don't do that. So I just thought about that on the way. And I, I was driving by myself, never said anything to anybody. And then I got a text message from my wife's twin sister, Magalis, uh, Pastor Dean called and wanted to know if it'd be okay with you to come in July uh, or August, what, what are we in? July, whatever, whatever week it is. <laughs> I knew I lost two hours going over from Pennsylvania. I didn't know if I also lost months, so I'm not sure how time zones work. And uh, when that happened, you know, that's what you call confirmation. Because there, there'd be no reason that early in the morning for me to be thinking about a meeting in December in New Mexico and then out of the blue, and then for it to be in his spirit, I know this week is divinely orchestrated by God. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you another thing while I'm at it. These kind of meetings, of course, Pastor Dean knows this, I know this, but there's very few people in this generation that know about this, this kind of thing. Like, for example, my dad's an evangelist. He's been, been an evangelist for about 45 years. And it was normal then, the minimum they would do would be one week. Now, and I'm not, the stuff I'm going to say that's different than this, I'm not against it. But my dad would do about a week, and then almost always it would go two weeks because the old preachers, if the first week didn't go well, they'd say, well, we didn't have a breakthrough yet, let's go a second week. And then if the first week went well, they'd say, well, we're in revival, let's go a second week. <laughs> so you'd, you'd, you'd end up with these nightly meetings and people's families being in them night after night. So... I know you were in these in December, most of you, but when you talk to your family, like, you're going to church again tonight, like, didn't you just go this morning, you're going Monday. And they, they think you're becoming a nun or a friar or something like that, or you lost your mind. What people don't realize is, you read in Acts chapter 19, it's not, it's not like it's Pentecostal tradition. Acts chapter 19, the Bible says that Paul preached in that city every day from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m., and in the second year of him doing that was when the devil started to come out of people and all the people burned their incantation books in the fire. So uh, I'm not gearing you up for me to be here for two years. I'm just telling you, when it comes to nightly meetings, that got replaced with like a conference style where you have six different speakers in a week, which is fine. We have meetings where we do stuff like that. 
But a lot of times, it's not like all the speakers are coming in for the whole week and hearing what direction things are going. Somebody flies in for their night, they get there an hour before, they do their thing that they did at the last city, and then they fly out when they're done, and it basically ends up like six people in a canoe with all their oars in the water rowing in their own direction. You can actually even have speakers that contradicted the thing the guy said the night before. And so these meetings that are revival-style meetings, where God builds every night. How many of you were here back in December? You remember how that went? Where obviously Monday was more powerful than Sunday. Thursday was more powerful than Monday. It, it grew, and the anointing grew, and the crowds grew. By the, by the end, we had this whole sanctuary filled with people in the overflow sanctuary, and that was when there was a 20-person limit by the government uh, for, for any indoor gatherings. Which is what made me immediately fall in love with the people of New Mexico. And so that's what this week's about. Use that word revival. What's revival? You can't revive something that hasn't been vived at least once. So revival breathes life. You know, as long as you have a flesh body, which is as long as you're on this earth, there's a part of you that the Bible says is carnal and doesn't want anything to do with God, doesn't matter how anointed you are. You know, I'm preaching this morning. When my alarm went off, I didn't want to go to church. And I'm the speaker. Because <laughs> your, body, your body has no interest in those kind of things. But then there's a spirit man in you that if you fill that spirit man, it dictates the course of your life and it goes up and not down. Get ready for the greatest week you've ever had in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you, if you have your Bible, to open it with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel, the third chapter. I'm going to preach a message this morning I've never preached before, but I think I'm going to preach it a lot before Jesus comes back. One thing that happened during COVID last year is when it looked like they were going to close down church meetings forever. Of course, me and my friend in the front row never, never honored that along with a lot of other people. But I started to look back on my YouTube messages from the week before everything closed down. I was in South Dakota. And I thought, if, that, if Jesus comes this week, would I be content with that Friday night meeting being the last address I ever gave to the people of planet Earth before I went up to heaven? And I don't know whether I, it was a good message. You know, I, pre I preached what I felt the Lord speak to me. But I just, I, I feel differently now. Because as you're watching Bible prophecy get fulfilled in real time, yeah. you do, you do. I mean, we always said it and always believed it. Jesus could come at any time. I believe that all the time. But now, I really believe it. Yeah. And so I am going to preach that kind of message this morning. If this was it, and Jesus was coming in two hours, this is what I would have to say to you out, out of my corazón. <laughs> Daniel 3, verse 8. Now, everybody was given an order to bow to a statue and worship it, which the Bible says will happen again when the Antichrist takes over. But some of the astrologers, verse 8, Daniel 3, 8, but some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, and it lists the other musical instruments. Verse 11, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. I want you to think of it. These men that defied this order were 17, 18, 19, no older than 25. It wasn't a $1,500 fine. You were to be thrown into a blazing furnace. And then three men did it, whom you put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to him, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his face became distorted with rage. We all know what that looks like from our mothers. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, loose and unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out of there and come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be torn into heaps of rubble. The more you read about Nebuchadnezzar, you realize he had kind of an anger problem. <laughs> there is no other God who can rescue like their God. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Quickly turn to the last book in the Bible. So the easy way to do it is go where your thick colored maps are in the back and then hang a left. <laughs> Revelation 13. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and the people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark in or on their right hand or in or on their forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without the mark, which was either the number, the name of the beast or the number representing his name. I want to show you something that's a principle in the Bible because the Bible says there will be an Antichrist, capital A, 
There'll never be somebody running for a world political office and it says, vote for Joe Antichrist. The Bible calls him the Antichrist. Christ is a word that means the anointed one. Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. Jesus was the, anoint, the anointed one. And the Antichrist will be the antithesis of Jesus Christ. He'll operate against the anointing. The Bible calls him the man of lawlessness, without affection for women. He'll actually be possessed, the Bible says, by Satan himself. And he won't just be a political leader. You know, people say, back when it looked like... Uh, when you had Arab Spring and it looked like Islam was looking to advance and take over, people said, well, will the Antichrist be a Muslim? No, he won't. The Bible says he'll exalt himself above every God there is and claim that he himself is God. And he'll demand that people worship him and worship the statue. And that mark in Revelation 13 says you can't buy or sell without it. But if you read chapter 14, it also is a mark of allegiance to worship the Antichrist and the statue that he set up. But notice, it's the same devil behind both things. Thousands of years before, there was a world leader named Nebuchadnezzar who set up a statue and demanded everybody worship it because it's the same devil that's behind both things. When you study, when you study Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler was, uh, had a religion being drawn up in Germany that they were already starting, where they were going to have their own Nazi religion that was above Catholicism. They were doing away with Protestant and Catholic churches, and Adolf Hitler was going to be their Messiah. Same devil. So I want you to see that what you face in your generation, this pressure to bow to the world, it's not some new thing. It is an age-old struggle. Notice if you read the book of Job, Satan appeared before God and said, if you give me my way, I can get Job to curse you. The devil has, is, has this obsession to take the thing God loves most. Everybody say me. me. God loves human beings. God sent his son to die for you. You're created in his image. Why do you think there's all those scriptures in the Bible that are obsessed telling you to be fruitful and have many children? Because God loves people. And Satan knows that God loves people. So he may, he, to get back at God, because he can never go up and slap God. The Bible says in Revelation that Satan went up to heaven to make war, but prevailed not. He can't even get to where God is. So since he can't do anything to him directly, he made a plan to do the thing that hurts him most, which is make the people that he loves turn against him and worship him. And I want you to see, you know, I was born in 1980 in olden days. It is. Back then you used a telephone. If you want to take a picture, you used a camera, not a telephone. In fact, back then, if you tried to take a picture of someone with a telephone, they looked at you funny. There, there seemed to be back then. I don't even, you don't even have to go back to 1980. The, you go back 15 years. Democrats were against transgender children. Yeah. Republicans were against transgender children. 2008, how many years ago? 13 years. Yeah. Barack Obama was against gay marriage. Yeah. John McCain was against, whoever, everybody. Every, it's like everybody had a line of morality that they didn't want to cross. And now that line is gone. Now it's like there's no gray area. It actually, it actually feels like what the Bible says, that you have to choose which path you're going to walk on. You either have to walk on the straight and narrow road. And I want to say that right up front. The road that leads to heaven is not a four-lane highway. The Bible says the way that leads to hell is broad for the many who choose the easy way. But the road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow and only a few people ever find it. There's not one person in this room from 65 years old to 8 years old that isn't faced with a pressure. And I want you to see this today. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not the only Hebrew children in Babylon. It wasn't all Babylonians worshiping that statue and then you had these three Hebrews uh, from a foreign land that stayed true to their God. Babylon was loaded with Hebrews at that time. Which means when, she, when that music played, and when the music played, everybody was forced to bow. And they stood up. They had other of their countrymen that were there in exile, that grew up in the temple. Say, hey, come on, man. God knows your heart. Compromise is such a subtle thing. 
I think one of the things when I've talked with pastors and other ministers over this last year and a half, you know, if somebody from some satanic group wrote something on your Facebook page because your church stayed open, you expect that. But when other pastors and Christians, so you people are crazy, you're going to get everyone killed and you don't even know what the Bible teaches. That's what hurts. And I want you to notice that, that not only did the Babylonians bow to that statue, all of the Hebrews bowed except those three that we have record of. You need to understand that the Bible says that heaven is reserved for those who overcome. To go to hell, you don't have to overcome anything. Any dead fish can swim downstream. To go to hell, don't do it. You just exist. Do what you're told. Do what the crowd's doing. But it takes determination and strength to go to heaven. To realize, I live in a wicked generation, but I'm not going to go the way of my generation. I make up my mind. As for me and my house, we will serve of the Lord. If that sounds like you, let heaven hear you today. Clap your hands in New Mexico and let that God know that he's got a room full of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, one of the things that it takes to do that in a wicked age, when the pressure gets turned up, like it's getting turned up now. If you're in high school, you're under pressure. If you're in junior high, you're under pressure. If you're in university, you're under pressure. If you're a young mother or father, you're under pressure. It, it, all kind, there's, it doesn't matter your age group, old and young. This is the devil's last great attempt to get you to compromise. Because if you compromise, you lose the power. The power of God flows through uncompromised, principled people. And if you're going to live that way, you can't make up your mind to do it and do it in your strength. It takes a supernatural passion for God. And that supernatural passion for God comes from the Holy Ghost. That's why Jesus, what did he say you would receive when, when you receive the Holy Spirit? You'll receive power. How do you see that power manifest in the book of Acts? Among other things, you see a man named Peter who denied Christ to a girl at a campfire. Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No. And then the same Peter, a few pages later, with thousands of men mocking what was going on in the upper room, Peter stepped forward from the other apostles and said, you men of Jerusalem, listen to me. Some of you are saying that we're drunk, but it isn't true. What you're seeing today was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. You skip down. The Bible says around verse 37 or 38 of Acts chapter 2, Peter continued preaching for a long time, telling them, save yourselves from this wicked generation that's gone astray. How do you turn from someone that couldn't tell a girl that you're a Christian as a grown fisherman to somebody that told 5,000, 6,000 men plus to shut up and listen to what I have to say? That can't be learned in a seminar. That can't come from taking boldness classes. That comes from carrying a fiery passion for God in your spirit. And that passion has to be caught. It's called impartation. I'm going to show you where I caught mine. This is a short video, a minute and a half. This is my dad, Tiff Shuttlesworth. That's an evangelist. This is a clip of him preaching in Andrew Cuomo's New York last year when you weren't allowed any indoor church services. And then when you see him, I'll make more sense to you because you catch it. My dad was talking about this kind of stuff. When I was a little boy, the day's going to come where they're going to try to close churches. The day's going to come where they're going to tell you to turn your Bibles in. The day's going to come where they're going to have to try to disarm the American public to do what the Bible says. You can't behead people for not taking a mark if they're armed. So it's not about safety. It's about having a population that can be controlled and not free. God is for freedom. You won't read anywhere in the Bible where God made anybody serve him. God is the one that's for freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And it's Satan who looks to bind and imprison. Here's my dad. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy 
in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. But he will keep you safe. Praise God. That is the promise of God. I'm not afraid of anything in this world. I'm certainly not afraid of some damn flu. And I use that word biblically. I am not going to stop the work of the Lord for some bacteria or virus. I'm not going to be an idiot. I'm going to be courteous. I'm going to do my best to be gracious. But I am not going to stop building the church for some demonic virus or some demonic mandate. I I am on a mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that too honest, Pastor? Jesus said, I'll build my church. That's my mandate. I'm not playing games. Many of you that know my ministry know that nobody's going to stop me. If it means I have to go to prison, I'll go to prison. If it means they put me on a firing squad, I'll be on a firing squad preaching to the last person loading their weapon. I am on a holy mission, and holy men don't take orders from unholy men. Who you hang around determines what you think is normal. That's the home I grew up in. So when people, man, you're awful bold. To me, it doesn't feel that way. Because I grew up with my dad. My dad's a soul winner. I was with my father, not just from the pulpit. I was with my dad in San Antonio when there were bikers hanging outside of a bar. They had leather biker vests on, no shirt underneath, and muscles. And my dad, my dad went over very nice and asked them about their eternity and salvation. And the one leader spoke up and said, I'm not afraid of hell. I want to go to hell. That's where all my friends are. And my dad very politely said, do you have a lighter? And he said, sure. My dad flicked the lighter and held the flame under his bare arm. And the guy went, what the blank are you doing? And my dad said, I don't think you'll do well in hell. (laughs) And flipped the lighter back. When you see that as a child, you don't know that's abnormal. You think that's normal behavior. And a lot of people didn't grow up in homes like that. But your children can grow up in a home like that. Because it only takes one person in the family to make up their mind. We're not going to live like the world. We're going to live on fire for Jesus Christ. Come on, if that sounds like you, let God hear your loud amen in New Mexico. One of the great things about preaching is if I could talk to you one-on-one, I would talk just like I'm talking right now. In fact, I had a friend whose dad was dying of cancer, who never went to church, and she asked me if I'd go to his home and pray for him. And I did exactly what I'm doing right now. I went dressed up, no tie, but sh- shirt and suit. I, I told him to be com- you know, sit where he's comfortable because he had stage four cancer. And I cracked my Bible open, and I preached to him with no mic for an hour and a half. She went to Isaiah, and Christ the healer had never been to church, and talked strong. You know, I didn't scream, but I, I talked like I'm talking. And then prayed for him. And so if I could, this is not like a group address. I would talk to you like like if this was the only time me and you were ever going to meet. Your soul has value. Jesus died for this crowd, but he also died just for you. And I want to see you make heaven. This hour, if you're going to make heaven, you don't make up your mind when you're tested. You make up your mind years before how you're going to live. And I want to show you just a few things that I've noted out of the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then I'm going to give you a call to take a stand for God. Number one, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made their decisions based on principle, not by consequence. You can talk to Pastor Dean. We all heard people talk like, well, I I would stay open, but they said they're going to fine us. You know, you never make decisions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't stand. And then they said, now listen, if you stand, we're going to throw you in the fire. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't realize it was that serious. You never allow yourself to make your decisions based on two things. Consequence. And number two, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't make their decision based on what's popular. They're the only three on record in that region of Babylon that stood. Daniel was there. I'm sure he stood. But in that story, three. What's popular is seldom what's right. 
And what's right is seldom what's popular. But that's not how they instruct you. They subtly instruct you. I mean, every news show, no matter whether you watch CNN, Fox News, what you watch, 61% of people think you should do this. You don't make decisions based on what the majority thinks. There's a multitude of stupid people. You don't listen to the crowd. You do what's right. What's right is rarely popular. And what's popular is rarely right. Now, I want you to think of that. In my day, anything you do that would send you to hell, that the Bible called sin, was also illegal. And now, you could not break one law and still go to hell. Very soon, there won't be any drugs that are illegal. They legalize marijuana. Synthetic heroin will be next. They've already done it in Western Canada. Anything there is to be made money off, the government's not going to let Mario make the money. They're going to make the money. And so there's nothing. You can be an alcoholic. That's not illegal. You can commit adultery. Not illegal. You can be high from morning till night. Now not illegal. You can do anything the Bible calls sexual immorality. And almost none of it's left illegal, and soon none of it will be. What's popular is not what's right. And what's right is not what's popular. Number two, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to be intimidated or have any fear. To make heaven. God told Jeremiah, don't fear their faces. It's not that you're an idiot. It's that you refuse to be intimidated by men who have compromised and you refuse to fear. See, the problem is not that people don't know what's right. The Bible says, I have shown you, O man, what is good. People know. People still, thieves still look both ways before they steal. Adulterers still close the blinds before they commit adultery. You don't close the blinds when you're baking a pie for your neighbor. There's something on the inside of people that witnesses that something's wrong. Well, you know, they said, you know, I heard stuff like this. One one person in central Pennsylvania. We were going to church during the pandemic, but then people posted photos of our church. And our employer said, if we see any pictures of you at church because you've been in contact with people, you'll lose your job. So, Pastor, I, I can't go to church. See, consequences. Intimidation. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced consequences, they didn't back down. They spoke stronger. Can you say amen? Amen. Number three, take a bold stand for God. God doesn't mind. When Peter was giving his address, God was going, hey, uh, you're saying what's right, but there's a better way to say it. You read another sermon, Acts chapter 7. That Stephen was confronted by the religious leaders. And at the end of his message, around verse 51, he said, You stiff necked, uncircumcised generation, hard of heart, your fathers never obeyed the prophets, and neither do you. And when he was stoned to death for his message, Jesus didn't call him aside and say, Now listen, we're gonna still let you into heaven, but you win more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. The Bible says, Jesus stood up. Stephen said, I see Jesus standing next to the Father. Normally, an angel brings you into heaven. The Bible says Jesus went up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. So why was he standing? Jesus listened to that bold stand for God and said, I'll get this one myself, brothers, and took him into heaven and received him, and he heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Take a bold stand for God. O king, picture this. 17-year-old men in the face of the king. O king, I'll give you one more chance to bow. O king, we're not careful to to answer you in this matter. That translation said we don't need to defend ourselves. Our God is able to deliver us from that fire. But even if he doesn't, O king, let us be clear. I'd rather burn in that furnace than serve your God. Now, I want to tell you something about that. Because what is that? They said, our God is able to deliver us. Then they said, even if he doesn't, we won't bow. That sounds like unbelief. But it wasn't unbelief. It's something actually a level past faith called trust. 
which is if I perish, I perish. When you read all the Old Testament saints, they had that way. Our, our God's a protector. Our God's a deliverer. But even if he doesn't, if I die, I die. I'm going to do what's right. I want you to say something with me. Say live for nothing. That's what most people do. Now I'm going to have you say a better thing. Say live for something. something. Not die for nothing. nothing. And then a third thing. Say live for nothing. nothing. Or die for something. something. All you were told the last 18 months was that the goal of life is survival. You could get sick. You could die. Let me tell you something. You can wear three masks. You can cover yourself in saran wrap and dip yourself in hand sanitizer every 15 minutes. It is appointed unto every man wants to die and after that the judgment. The goal of life is not to stay alive. The goal of life is one day for your grandkids to look back and say, my grandfather set a standard for this family. My grandmother set a standard for this family. One of the things, I I took advice from a man named Dr. T.L. Osborne and it helped me to not get comfortable in America because he said, immerse yourself in the stories of persecuted Christians around the world. And so I did that. I was preaching in South Africa and while I was there, it was in the news that in the north of Kenya, some terrorists from Somalia that are trying to take that northern region of Kenya boarded a city bus and said, all of the Christians get off the bus and had them line up. I mean, these are, this isn't Africa with a loincloth, bare chest. This is a suit and tie Africa. People on their way to a job, an oil job, just like us. Imagine being on your commute to work. Everybody that's a Christian stand here. And so all the Christians got off. And they went down the line and made them recite the Islamic conversion prayer. And every Christian did it except one. And that man said, when they told him to quote that, that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And when they did, they shot him in the head. And they were interviewing the mother and his three children. The three children were there and they were interviewing the wife. You would have thought that that man just won five straight episodes of Jeopardy. (laughs) Or pitched a complete game shutout in the World Series. That lady wasn't crying. That lady had a huge smile on her face. She said, I heard what my husband did. That he refused to get on his knees. And that he stood for the Lord. And I told my children, the children are all smiling. I told them, your dad's in heaven. He stood for Jesus. You know, I I thought after that. I thought, how would it feel if you were one of the Christians that knelt? I'm sure in the first three minutes, it would have felt great. I survived. (laughs) But then I wonder how it felt about 30 minutes later. Where you realized you're a loser. I told my wife the other day, I said, if we had honored the shutdown and quit preaching, I couldn't even stand to hear myself preach. I told her, I'm not joking. I said, if I preach to the people about healing while I was talking, I know how I I know me pretty well. My own brain would have said, you're a liar. You don't believe one word you said. You shut your traveling down for 18 months until the CDC gave you the green light and said it was safe again. I wouldn't have any respect for myself. I would feel, I I don't want to live like, I would actually rather die for for the cause of Christ than live as a compromised coward. And I want you to hear something today. The Bible says there are multitudes in the valley of decision. There's going to be very few people in hell because they're committed Satanists. And they kill goats and drain blood on an altar and worship the devil. That's hell's not going to be full of those people. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, I would that you be hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, ever say lukewarm, lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. And then Jesus said, I'm giving time in that same chapter, Revelation 3, that you would turn from your indifference. Indifference is the sin in America. People aren't Satanists, but they're not on fire for God. They're just nothing. 
I just, you know, I might go, would you like to come to the church with me? Um, I might come one day. I had to see my, wa- my um, washing machine broke. And I have to find out when the guy is coming to repair it. And then my son, um, he has little league practice, I think. It, there's just, there's no passion. They don't have what Shadrach, Meshach, and their life is just waking up in the morning, see who texted them, what errands they have to run. But a man that makes heaven has principles. They have a path. They've marked out a destination and marked out a path, and they stay on that path and stay safe. Can I tell you something? Every one of you, you will live like that from this day forward. No more cowardice. No more lukewarmness. No more indifference. You will serve God with a passion I've been reading I've been reading those stories since I was a little boy David 17 and I'm preaching to a room full of people of all different ages so I'm not looking to single out the youth but youth's a great time youth's a time you know where, where people try to kill that fire they say oh you're young and so, you know, I used to preach like this when I was 21. Like, oh, you're young, you know, you'll see there's... No, I, I still stand on the chairs at 40. I don't have in my notes, after this point, stand on chair to emphasize. <laughs> it's passion. You heard my dad. Yeah, he's not 20. He's 61 in that, in that video. Passion doesn't know an age. The world tries to stamp it out of you, write it off to youth or ignorance. Well, you're just young. I was reading on the 4th of July, the ages of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence to fight and overthrow British tyranny. All 17 to 25, with few exceptions. I think the oldest man was 33, one was 30. Thomas Paine was 33, he was an author. One was 31. They were young men that when they saw what's wrong, said, I'm going to do something about it. This church is loaded with young people, as all good churches are. And that's what the world, oh, yeah, yeah, I know you think everything's wrong and you can change the world, but you'll find out, no, don't listen to people like that. Because I'm now their age and I'll tell you the opposite. The things you see that are wrong are probably something God has anointed you to fix. Because when Goliath stood and cursed God every day, it was all the professional military men. He's a very great man and he's killed many people. And one 17-year-old assigned to bring cheese sandwiches to his brothers came and heard that man cursing God and said, you will die before sundown. And every professional person tried to talk him out of it. You're just a boy. He's been in the army since he was a boy. You're making a big mistake. The battle you're going to fight to live an uncompromised life for God. You're not just going to get pressure from the world. You're going to get pressure from religious people. Well, you know, I believe in God, too. I don't think you have to take it that seriously. I'm telling you right now, make the one great decision that I made in life. One, not only to serve God, but two, hang around people that are on fire for God. How could I have operated the way I did the last year and a half during COVID if my overseer was telling me I'm making a mistake. You're making our denomination look bad. But I don't have an overseer like that. I have an overseer that went to jail. And he would call me after he heard me talking and say, I know you probably feel like you're speaking very boldly, but you actually need to be more bold. Call those things out. Sometimes I do an episode of Check the News and feel like I crossed the line. And he'd call me and say, that was good that you said that. Say it stronger next time. (laughs) You're going to make few mistakes going too extreme for God. What this world needs, and I pray God will use my little life to make an impact in it this week. Imagine if you had 25 young men and women rise up out of this meeting and say, I'm going to serve the Lord with a passion. There's a man named Dr. Bensonita Hosa. When he was born in Nigeria, Nigeria, the whole country had 400 total churches, Catholic and Protestant added together. When he died, He had started 9,600 churches, and he made a statement, never underestimate what your boldness for God can do for a city. Do you know how his ministry started? He was 15 years old, listening to an Assemblies of God missionary, white guy in Benin City, that had started a church there. And that man read the scripture where Jesus said, where you go to preach, 
heal the sick and raise the dead. And he never heard another word after that. When he heard raise the dead, it stood out to him. And he was waited after a 15-year-old black Nigerian teenager with a bicycle. Waits after to talk to the 40-some-year-old white missionary. He said, Jesus said we can raise the dead? Yeah, yeah. The missionary said, yes. He said, have you done it? He said, no. He said, but I can do it? And thank God the missionary said, yes. He didn't try to talk him out of it. Well, he doesn't really mean the spiritually dead, amen. <laughs> he said, yeah, you can do it. And the next morning, he got on his bike at 8 in the morning as, as a 15-year-old and went door to door trying to see if anybody had died. <laughs> it took him till 2 p.m. And when he got to the one house, he didn't have to ask, crying and wailing. And he came in as a stranger. A three-year-old girl named Inwata had died. The family was holding her. And he had read how Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. Put everybody out of the room. Now you think of the boldness and authority to walk into a stranger's home with their dead child and order them out of their own house. Yeah. He did. He said, Jesus sent me to your home today. Everyone get out of the house. And they listened. People respond to boldness and authority. Yeah. Do you know when you're bold, most people have never dealt with a bold person. Yeah. People just acquiesce to whatever environment they're in. Yeah. They're a Democrat around Democrats. A Republican around Republicans. They're conservative around conservatives. They're, they drink when they're around drinkers. Don't drink if they're around people who don't drink. They're of no, they don't hold any opinions of anything. Everybody out of the house. He said, I prayed for the little girl when I got done praying. She had seen more dead. And then he said, I reread the scripture to see where I missed it. And Jesus said, damsel arise. And then the prayer says, oh. So he opened the door and said to the family outside. The girl that Jesus prayed for, his name was Damsel. What's your daughter's name? <laughs> so God doesn't need you to hold a double master's degree. He responds to bold faith. He said her name's Inwata. And he said, I walked over to the body and said, Inwata, arise. And she sneezed and started breathing. And he picked her up and handed her back to the family. Did you know his wife, who's still alive, Margaret Idahosa? That was her older sister. That was in Water's older sister. She married him. I mean, you see a guy walk into your house and do that, you think, I'm probably not going to do too much better than him. <laughs> She's still alive and pastor in the church. He got his wife from that miracle. Did it again the next day and found someone. And after the second one, word got out in the city that there was some 15-year-old Christian running around the city raising the dead. He printed up crude flyers in the 1960s. Went all around Benin City. Bring the blind. Bring the sick. Bring the crippled. Not if you're crippled, stay home. If you're bring all the sick people and Jesus will heal you today. And at 15, held a meeting with tens of thousands and broke Christianity into that region. There are people sitting here today that God is going to anoint you. It's not just going to change your life. God is going to use you to Run the devil. Clear out of New Mexico and out of your generation in Jesus' name. If you believe it, shout amen like thunder. Stand boldly for the Lord. Conclusion. Five practical things. Now you hear that and you get all fired up. Now what do you do? Because there's nothing wrong with just walking out of church for the rest of the day. But it won't produce much. What are five practical things that God would call every person in this room to do today? Number one, understand that your destiny is controlled only by your obedience or disobedience to God. No man has the power to destroy your life. If you don't bow, I'll throw you in the furnace. God doesn't allow wicked men to determine your destiny. That's right. And God can't determine your destiny. You decide which way you're going to go and how high you're going to fly. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Today I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Oh, that you would choose life. That would be a great name for a church. 
Oh, that you would choose life. That you and your descendants. Everybody say my descendants. My descendants. That you and your descendants might live. My destiny is not controlled by my government. My destiny is controlled by my obedience to God and his word. And when I make a decision to follow God's word, the consequence is notwithstanding. Jesus said, the man who hears my word and doeth it is like a wise man who builds his life, his house on the rock. The same wind blows that blows on everybody else. The same waves crash that crash against anybody else. But when it goes away, and they do go away, if, there's another quote from another great man of God. If you don't quit, the devil will. The devil's a quitter. He's a professional quitter. He doesn't know what to do with somebody that won't back off. He doesn't know what to do with people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's used to 999 times out of 1,000. If he says, we'll heat the furnace hotter. Okay, we're sorry, sir. We, you know, I'm sorry. There's probably a better way to go about things. After all, you are in charge. He's not used to dealing with people that are too weird to get scared. I was preaching uh, during the lockdown, and I got a friend of mine that's the warden of a prison, and she keeps me on preaching in the prison. And one of the times when I was preaching, because it was back when you could get arrested, like April 2020, I said, I'll happily go to jail for this. I would actually go with a smile on my face. If you remember last year, I'd already grown out a mullet. (laughs) That was in preparation for going to prison. (laughs) If I was going to go, I wanted to look like I got transferred there. I'm going in with my hair parted on the side. Hello, my name's Jonathan. Does anyone know where my... You must be left eye. You're my bunk mate. Good to meet you. Uh, officer, our toilet seems to be missing a lid. Uh, I, I had already hardcore committed. And her officer that was watching it, one of the corrections officers said... I, I hear people say they're willing to go to jail, and you can tell they don't mean it. Talking about criminals. He's not a Christian. He said, that guy actually looks like he's looking forward to going. <laughs> oh, yeah. I won't tell you all the things that happened to Rodney Howard Brown's ministry after he got arrested. I told him on the phone the other day, I don't know if he agrees or not, but I said, of all the things you've done in the ministry, the best decision you ever made was to get arrested. <laughs> people started coming to his church from all over the country because they heard about somebody that actually believed in what they believed. And that's scriptural. Nebuchadnezzar, when he saw the commitment of those boys, said, bring them out here for they were willing to defy the king. That's kind of a weird thing to say when you're the king. So your boss that says, if you won't work Sunday mornings, I'll fire you. Or your coach that says, if you won't come and play on Sundays, then you're off the team. They make it seem like they don't respect you. But when you say, that's fine. But I am a full-time, Jesus is my Lord. And on Sundays, I'm in his house. It actually impresses them. Because they've never met a Christian like you. They've heard people talk about a little. They've heard people that yell at people for drinking so they can feel more righteous. But they've never met somebody that their God, who laid down their life for them, they will lay down their life for their God. And it impresses them. It turns them. That man I brought up, Ben Sinidahosa, when he started his ministry, you know, there's Muslim insurgents everywhere. He was hard on Islam. He would speak from his pulpit. When the, Islam, when the Muslims were attacking the Christians, he got on his TV program on Sunday morning and said, I want every Christian to buy a machete this week. And if a, if a jihadist comes to your door, pick the center of his forehead. You would think that would make Muslims not want anything to do with your ministry, but they actually got saved by the multiplied tens of thousands and came to his church because they never saw somebody yeah. that had a boldness for their God like that. Most of us have never seen anybody like that. The Christians in your family, people think part of being Christianity is you turn into some weakling. That's why I love all the MMA guys that that are born again. Because when I was growing up, there'd be like a football player. He'd get saved, and he had 19 sacks the year before, and then the next year that he got saved, he had one sack. It's like like it took his spot. That's not Christianity. 
I had an MMA fighter that got saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost in my meeting. He said, how can I hit someone in the face now that I'm a Christian? I said, with an anointing. That person should know they've been tagged by a Christian. Read the men in the Bible. Abraham didn't send his men into battle. Abraham led his men into into battle at 85 years old. Christianity doesn't take your passion away. Christianity should fill you with a fire in your heart. I will live for God and trample the devil under my feet. Come on, if you make that decision today, clap your hands one more time and give the Lord a mighty shout. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. My destiny is only controlled by, by my obedience to God. Number two, you make up your mind like Joshua did. As for me and my house, not we're going to try to start serving the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Number three, make up your mind like Joshua. Genesis 18, 19 with Abraham. I know I can bless Abraham for he will train and teach his descendants to keep the way of the Lord. Make up your mind that my children are going to serve the Lord. Don't say stupid things that you're taught to say even in American Christianity. Well, you know, when people become teenagers, you know, when your boy becomes a teenager, he's got to go out there. And, no, he doesn't. In this day and age, if you allow your child to go out and experience life, slash turn their back on God for three years, you don't have any guarantee you'll ever get them back. If there was ever a day to make up your mind from the time you're six years old, I'm going to serve the Lord, that day is today. Number four, I will never bow to the pressures of life. I don't care what manipulative tactic there is. You know, to be honest with you, I never had strong opinions on vaccines until this happened. And now, just because of the pressure tactics that are being used, you've made me forge an opinion. I will not be shamed into doing something. I won't be pressured into doing something. I won't do something for a free Krispy Kreme donut. And if you push, you you, you galvanize me. You can't make me feel bad for doing what's right. I'm going to do what's right. Can you say amen? Amen. Number five. And finally, make a public stand for God. Every call God ever gave to man in the Bible was public. Adam, where are you? Acts chapter 2. How did they know 3,000 men came out of the crowd and responded? Because they had to come out of the crowd and respond. Billy Sunday, the great American evangelist whose dad was an abusive drunk. And when he got saved, preached against alcohol and broken homes to the point that they amended the Constitution of the United States for almost 10 years to make alcohol illegal. He used to say something when he called people to Christ. He'd have them kneel at the altar. And he said, if you can't kneel for Jesus in a church, how will you ever stand for him in the world? Billy Graham. You know, I hear people now, you don't have to give public altar calls or an embarrassment. You don't have to do that. Boy, I wish they were around to, I wish Billy Graham was still alive so they could have told him how much better his ministry would have been if he just told everybody to sit in their seats in the stadium and think about it and that it's private. No one needs to see, but you know, I want to go see him at Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And from the beginning when he got the mic, first words out of his mouth, at the end of my message, I'm going to give a public and clear call for you to come out of your seats and stand at this altar and make Jesus Christ your Lord. After point one, he'd say it again. After point two, he'd say it again. The whole thing was gunning to make a public stand. Then he'd say at the end, now I want to give this call some. You're in the third tier of the stadium. You're going to start to need to leave now to make your way down the concourse to get here in time, but come. Those of you that are here, come. Don't let anything hold you back. Come to the altar. Those people would come with tears in their eyes. I was already saved, but I never stood on a major league baseball field before, so I came and pretended to get saved. They came, they came and stood publicly and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. When I was born, they started this other move where they gave these 
Everybody head bowed, nobody looking around. You lift that hand, God sees that hand, I see that hand, and that's all that matters. And uh, 30 years of camouflage altar calls produced a generation of camouflage Christians that are afraid to pray over their meal at work. They just, they just squint or something. People work a job for 20 years. None of their coworkers know they go to church. That camouflage style of making a stand for God produced people. You know, faith, you know, faith's a private thing. Not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That there really is a heaven. There really is a hell. But you don't have to go to hell. God made a way through the cross of Jesus Christ that you and your family can be saved. I'm going to give you that call today. And I want you to make this day, July 25th, the day where that's your new birthday. That is the day where I settled forever that me and the devil are done. And I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm going to have an evangelist come here on Tuesday. I'm going to preach, but he's going to share a testimony with you. He just did a crusade in Chiapas, Mexico. And the cartel, whatever cartel's in charge of that area of Mexico, forbids them to have a crusade or, or to have a, a church. And so he was there to build a home for the pastor. A Sicario came by, cartel hitman, and said, this isn't a church, is it? He said, no, it, it's a home for the pastor. And he kept coming by to check up on it. Well, one day he comes by and says to this evangelist who was preaching in the area, I've heard you're a preacher. I want you to come to my home and pray for me. Well, you know, that's a risk. Because a lot of times when a hitman invites you to their home, it isn't for prayer. <laughs> and he went. He said, I need prayer. Laid his hands on him. And that man flung himself to the ground and started to slither like a snake as demons came out of him. They came out. He prayed the sinner's prayer. But he told a vision he saw while he was down on the ground. This happened one week ago. He's coming straight here. I want him to tell. They had a power. It shook the region. That man said, when I was down on the ground, I saw a vision. Satan was on one side, and he was very angry with me. And Jesus was standing on the other side, and I was in the middle. And he said, Satan said, very angrily, what else do you want? I've given you everything. I've given you homes. I've given you jewelry. I've given you cars. I've given you money. What else do you want? I've given you everything. And when he paused, Jesus said, I died for you. And that is the difference. Buddha didn't die for you. Muhammad expected you to die for him. But Jesus left heaven to die on the cross for you. And when you receive that, you receive his power. And he said, then you take up your cross and lay down your life for the gospel. He that tries to keep his life for himself will lose it. There's a church near where my wife and I live. 2,500 seater was packed every Sunday. Closed for COVID to be safe. Mashed up afterwards. Closed down again during the Thanksgiving wave. 120 people attended their service two weeks ago in a 2,500 seater. Those that try to keep their life will lose it. Then other people stayed open. You're going to cause a problem. You're going to you watch. You're going to people are going to die. And then the place can barely fit all the people in. Because those who give their life away from me in the gospel, they will find true life. There's an old saying in, among African preachers. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, if we die, our God's, if you throw us in there, our God's able, but even if he doesn't, we'll never bow. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. The saying in Africa is about Christians. The man who says, if I perish, I perish, never perishes. Because once you cross that line, that I don't care anymore. You actually become unkillable. See, the devil said, if you bow, if you don't bow, you'll burn. But if you do bow, you won't burn. The only people who that fire killed 
were the guards who bowed. And the men who refused to bow never were burned. The truth is, if you do compromise, if you do bow, it seems safe. But the ones that bow are the ones who burn. But the ones who don't bow can't burn. Though your enemy attacks you from one direction, I will make them run from you in seven directions. Jesus didn't stand with them when they were being manipulated. Jesus didn't stand with them when they announced their decision. But when they crossed that line and said, I'd rather fry in that thing than worship your ugly God. They threw three men in and Nebuchadnezzar, who was no prophetess, said, how many men are in there? Four. How many did I throw in? Three. The one looks like the son of God. Jesus stood there with them. Jesus will never let you take your beating for him alone. He's there in the fire for those who are willing to stand in the fire. Stand on your feet, everybody. Bow your head and close your eyes. You're not facing a fiery furnace. You're not facing Islamic jihadists threatening to cut your head. But I doubt there's one person in this room that isn't faced with a decision right now to compromise in some way. To bow to that statue in some way. I met a lady in Philadelphia at one of our meetings. She came up to me at the end on Friday night. She, she had made a commitment to serve Jesus Christ. And she said, I don't know what to do. I said, what's the problem? She said, where I live, I live with a man I'm not married to. And, and when she said, and, I just finished the sentence. Because I, I don't only know the Lord, I know my enemy, the devil. I said, and he said, if you're not willing to sleep with him anymore, he's going to throw you and your kids out of the house. How'd you know? Because I know the devil. He works by manipulation. And I don't want to sleep outside with, with, with my family and all that. See, that's what you face in America. If I don't work Sundays, I'll lose my job. What if you play for a soccer team during Gay Pride Month in June? You have to wear a rainbow patch. If I don't wear it, they said they'll kick me off the team. Now in the NFL, if I don't get vaccinated, I'm, I'm off the team. Pressure. Well, you know, and then I won't have any money. I want you to understand something. God didn't just... Rescue them from the fire. They were promoted to even higher positions. Don't you ever let any devil convince you that he has the power to make you lose one dollar. If God is for you. What knucklehead thinks they can be against you? Let God arise and his enemies will scatter. And there are people here that are under manipulation right now. We're a Catholic. If you keep going to that church. Meanwhile, no one's been to a Catholic church for in 20 years in the whole family. So you go to that church. And I'm not paying for your college. No, that's how it works. And you become some little manipulable bum that got their college paid for. But I'm not looking for those people today. I'm looking for moms and dads. If you're a father that's here, so am I. I know about pressure, about how to raise your children and not what to do, what not to do. But if God's looking for fathers that are going to be like Abraham. Yeah. In this house, we live in America, but in this house, it's not America. It's like uh, Abraham's land. We keep an altar before the Lord. My sister and her husband just built a home up in Canada. They had to explain to the architect up in Quebec what a prayer room is. Because they built one in the center of their home. They built a room with an altar just to pray. That's the new generation type of family that God's raising up. Where the mom doesn't take the kids to church while the dad does home improvement projects. Or watch NFL pregame. That the dad's the one that's dressed first. And in this house, we are in the Lord's house every day. How does that start? That starts with a public commitment. Because I will tell you, as someone who's done it, there is something about coming out of a crowd and saying, I don't care what everybody else thinks. I'm going to stand in an altar and make Jesus Christ my Lord. I don't know how you got married, but that's how I got married. My wife stood with me publicly at an altar. And before witnesses, hundreds of them, I'm with him forever. Isn't it interesting that we're not called the girlfriend of Christ or the fiance of Christ? The church is called what? What's the difference between a girlfriend, a fiance, and a bride? All three love the guy. 
but only one has stood at an altar. What would I have done if my wife sent word through her maid of honor? A dollar still loves you. She still wants to be with you, but she's embarrassed to be seen with you in front of all these people. If I had any sense in my head, I'd run. What about the person? Well, I, I believe in Jesus. I, I don't think you have to do all that. It's a problem. The bride has stood and forsaken all others and said, I'm with him forever. And I made that decision with Christ. And you're going to make that decision for Christ today. And you watch what it changes. The tears stream down people's face and they're just standing 30 feet from where they were sitting. But there's something about telling the devil goodbye and saying, Jesus, you died for me and my life belongs to you. And I want everybody to know this man is a Jesus man. This woman is a Jesus woman. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I pray as people respond right now that there would go a shockwave of the anointing through that family. Every chain that's still set up from witchcraft or false religion or religious Christianity, I pray that their decision when they make that stand would blow through that whole family and everyone in that house would serve the Lord. I pray for those that are the only one in their house that they're going to go home and not one person supports that decision. I thank you for power in the Holy Ghost to stand amongst those who bow. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you say, Jonathan, I've never taken a stand publicly to serve Jesus Christ. Or I once did, but I fell away. I'm not living a holy life. I'm living a compromised life. There are areas in my life that I've allowed myself to bow to the bales that are in this world. Well, the Bible just says, don't, don't be drunk. It doesn't say you can't have some drinks. That kind of thing. American compromised Christianity. One hand on the cross, one hand on the world. But today, I let go of the world. I let go of the flesh. I let go of the devil. And I put both my hands on the cross of Jesus Christ. Whatever the consequences entail, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, our God, my God's able to deliver me. But even if he doesn't, I'd rather go down with Jesus than stay walking the earth, a compromise, where your own heart, you're ashamed of yourself. You get rid of that today in Jesus' name. I want those of you with more boldness to respond first. Your boldness will help those that are wired a little more timid. But every person that says, Jonathan, that's me. Today I make up my mind on the first day of this revival. I'm going all in with God. I've never done that before. Or I once did, but I backslid, but I come back to the Lord today, never to part again. I want you to bravely hold that hand up high and wave it at me in Jesus' name and we're going to pray. I see your hands. I see more hands. Very quickly, I want everyone that lifted a hand and meant business with God. Quickly come out of your seat and stand at the altar and we're going to pray right now in Jesus' name. This is your stand for eternity. Every hand that was lifted, come. Today's your day. Jesus loves you. Anyone else before we pray if God's dealing with your heart? If you're coming, you can still come. Everyone that's here, I want you to lift both hands to God as a sign of surrender and open your heart to Him. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But even while you're praying this prayer, Christ is going to come into your heart. And when Jesus steps in, everything that's not of Christ has to step out. He'll make His home in your heart, and He's not going to share that home with anybody else. Get ready for the Lord to touch you like no one else right now. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I've come forward today to take my stand. I will serve you all the days of my life. I repent of my sin. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. 
Jesus Christ is my King, my Lord, and my Savior. Help me, Father. Give me your power to live righteously in a world of wickedness. In Jesus' name. I'm going to add something in. Say, Father, as I've taken this stand today, I thank you for your word. It declares that my house will serve the Lord. I thank you, Jesus. Not one member of my family will be missing in eternity. In Jesus' name. With your hands lifted, let me bless you now. And I mean bless you. I don't mean a sneeze, I bless you. I mean a real blessing. In the name of Jesus, every woman that stands before me, every man, whatever chain the enemy wrapped around you to bind you, to manipulate you, where you knew the right thing to do, but always went the other direction. That chain is declared broken now in the name of Jesus Christ. The enslaving yoke of sin is destroyed now. The devil is no longer your master. The devil no longer gets to determine your thoughts and your decision making. Your life from today will be ruled by the peace of God, by the power of the Holy Ghost. I loose right now what so many in your generation lack. I loose a boldness in your spirit to serve the Lord. You mark my words. The next time you're confronted, the next time you're challenged, there will be a, a gusher that rises up on the inside of you that the things you used to say yes to, you'll say no. In Jesus' name, keep your hands lifted. By impartation, I lose a passion for God, a fire that cannot be quenched for God, for Christ, for his word, and for the advancement of his kingdom. In Jesus' name, I pray there won't be one of you that in the next seven days don't hear from somebody close to you. You're different now. Whether they mean it as a compliment or an insult, it'll be a sign to you that God has done a visible work in you. Every plan the devil had to take you to hell, it has already failed in Jesus' name. When that trumpet sounds, we will be standing together in the presence of Jesus. The devil has lost you forever today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You can put your hands down and look up at me. Welcome to the family of God. Among many things, one of the great things about revival meetings like this is the devil likes to get you to feel like you're alone. You know, no one's serving the Lord, it's just you, and you're probably taking it too seriously. But all this week you'll see there's at least one person crazier than you. Then you don't feel so crazy. Just like me, with my dad. You're my dad, when you're surrounded by people that are taking the same bold stand, people can't convince you that you're nuts or whatever. Of course, as far as the world is concerned, you are, but you're not. You're serving the Lord. You're making a decision. And the reason people try to press you so hard to compromise and come back is your life, without you saying anything, convicts them. Next place you go where you used to drink with people, you don't have to tell them not to drink. Just you not ordering one. What's with you? Nah, I'm not having it. Why not? Let me buy you one. Your cheap friend that's never bought a drink for anybody. Because just you doing what you're doing shows them that the lie the devil, everybody's doing it. No, now everybody's not. I, my, you're not. And now you're a light in darkness. And it convicts them. So, okay, now you're holier than us. Now you let them talk. It's their own convictions bubbling out of their mouth. When they get all done rambling on, just go, I love you. I actually love you more now than I did before. You're great. And I'm still your friend. Because it's not you they're mad at. They're working some personal things out, and since God's not available to yell at, they pick you. 
That's why Jesus said, anybody that takes revilement for my sake, I'll give them my blessing. Because you're just getting yelled at for Jesus. Amen? You'll do what you set out to do. You know, people say, what does a little commitment make at an altar? As many as received him, to them he gave power. It would say power. He gave power to become the sons and daughters of God. So that's what you felt the Lord doing on the inside of you. you don't, you'll look the same, but you're not the same. You leave here now carrying something on the inside of you that the devil doesn't know what to do with. Holy Ghost power. So tonight, tonight at 6.30, tonight 6.30, and then 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. I'm not a stand-up comedian. This wasn't my one routine, and then I do it the rest of the nights like Las Vegas. God will build every night. So don't miss it. And then people you were thinking about, man, I wish they were here. Get them here. That's why we're here more than one day. And this week is going to be the worst week the devil's ever had and the best week you and your family have ever had in Jesus' name. I'm going to have uh, your pastor give you a benediction and some instruction. I want you to know I'm very proud of you. If I wanted you to go to hell, I, I was like, these people. I wouldn't have preached like I did. I knew there were people here. Obviously, you're in church. So you're not a, as rotten as the devil would want you to think you are. But you needed to cross a line today, and you crossed it, and you'll never go back. Amen? Give them one more great hand clap. In Jesus' name, God bless you.